So we're almost coming to the end here. We've got a few more lectures coming up, but uh, I was asked to talk a little bit about building teams. How many of you guys already have a team that you've already working together on? Raise your hand high. It doesn't look like you're confident about that. All right, some of you guys have teams you're working with. Hopefully, you like the people you're working with because that's going to be a painful journey if you don't like those people. Uh, so I wanted to spend a little time talking about how you might be able to build a strong and lasting team. I unfortunately, uh, we, we have a program called Venture Lab. I'm just going to do a shameless plug right now. We incubate early stage startups. They might not be much, might be two people with an idea and they need some help taking it to the next stage. And uh, we have incubated dozens and dozens of companies that way. Several have become quite successful, self-sustaining, $14, $15 million a year. I think at th this point, they're like $25 million a year business. Um, we've had several that have exited that way or gone out that way. But recently, we've had several teams, I would say two of them in the summer, really strong, strong founder teams that collapsed. Uh, they won't talk to each other now. It's two teams that are like that. Uh, even the best teams somehow have those issues that where, where people conflict. So part of this discussion is not only about how do you build a good team, but it's also how do you maintain a good team. And so I'm going to jump in real quick here. We talked about how entrepreneurship is kind of like a game, right? Essentially, you've got a goal. You want to make a whole lot of money. You want to get a product out there. And you have to come up with all the ways that you can do that. And the game rules are typically set by the market, by your customers, by the people around you, right? And so this whole game that you're going to play is complex because you don't know all of the rules. Um, but what we do know is that the process of innovation is pretty, pretty simple. You guys have seen these images before, but I changed out the words. The process of, of innovating, we talked about it being social. Well, the process of innovating involves learning. So you have to learn something about the area that you are focused on, right? If you're going to build something, you better be the foremost expert on that thing, right? So it's going to involve a whole lot of learning. But the second part then is you can spend a lot of time innovating and adapting because your initial ideas will be wrong and you'll have to adapt from what you learn. You have to always look and always have a plan B to back up your original plan. Once you've figured things out, what you end up doing is you end up becoming a teacher because if you have discovered something brand new, there's no one else in the world who can let the world know about it except for you. So you are the first teacher of that brand new thing, right? And this is the brilliance of Steve Jobs. He knew when he was introducing new technology, he had to be the foremost teacher about how to use it, what's so great about it, what is the value in all of the new things that he's created. So your process of innovation looks very much like this. All right, the journey that you're going to take as an entrepreneur, we've talked a little bit about this before, but it's a whole lot of stuff. And it is impossible to be excellent at everything and have enough time to do all of it at the same time. So of course, it's a team sport, which was the first slide that we talked about. You have to find a team to do all this stuff. So how do you get there? If you're just here in this first, first mile? Well, guidance is key. and I've talked a little bit about this in the past, but what I mean by guidance is that you get guidance not only from your advisors, like in the middle, but you get guidance from your employees. Oftentimes they have information that you don't have. Your founders, your, your co-founders, your partners, you need to talk to them regularly because there's information that they're seeing as they're talking to customers that you're not talking to, employees that you're not talking to that somehow all that information comes together to give you a full picture. So you need to listen to all of these people. But most importantly, you also need to learn from your competitors. Your competitors are mentors as well. They will tell you what not to do because they might spend a whole lot of money going down one path that's completely wrong. 
and you can thank them for spending that money so you didn't have to learn that lesson with your own money, right? So you have to look at everyone in this race as someone you can learn from. Because this guy here is running this fat, super fast because the guy next to him is running almost as fast as him. Your competitor next to you is someone you can learn from and draft next to. A couple other things that I want to tell you a bit about. I love this slide. <laughs> um, I was talking to someone about entrepreneurs. It turns out, I, it's my opinion, that entrepreneurs are generally really bad listeners. In fact, I would say that students who are high performing students at, at university typically are really bad listeners as well. And the reason why is because you were oftentimes deemed a great student because you had the answer before anyone asked the question. So you didn't have to listen because you were ready for the answer before anyone asked the question. But the lesson that I've learned as an entrepreneur is that if you stop for a second and you listen to people, they will actually tell you how to solve the problem that they're having. And it's, but it's really tough to stop talking and listen to the other person speak, right? Because you, you don't get an A for being quiet, right? And so this is one of those powerful tools that we'll circle back to over and over as a theme as we talk about what it means to be a great entrepreneur. And the reason I'm talking about what it means to be a great entrepreneur is that these, as a team, you need to have all of these elements that don't seem like things you can learn in a book. The ability to self-learn, honesty, communication. These aren't things that are super easy to somehow read about, right? Uh, but these are critical to a, a successful exit. So this self-learning that we just talked about is one of the key elements, this tinkering mentality. How many of you guys like Legos? Raise your, okay, everyone likes Legos. That's tinkering, right? Because you love to just put things together and build, build things. You know, having this love for how, uh, discovering how things work is super important, as well as being able to seek insights in the things that you've experienced and being able to apply these lessons and try to improve. Right? These are key elements of, of that. And some of you guys, this is natural. This is what you do every day. But other people, this isn't so natural, to be introspective, to understand why they didn't do something right. But this is key. If you don't have this, make sure someone on your team does. The engineer on the team oftentimes behaves this way. And sometimes you might have an engineer on your team that's so this way that if you mention something in a meeting, the next week they have come up with a draft version of it or a prototype of it, which I work with Iklak, he's, he's that guy for me. So if I mention anything about a program the next week, he has it completely designed out because he was just tinkering with it. So you need balance. If you don't, if you, this is not you, find someone who is like this to be a part of your team. Efficient communication, I can't stress this enough. It's gotta also be effective. I was talking about earlier when you, uh, when you have a situation and I'll ask you, would you rather be right or would you rather be effective? You might get into arguments with your coworkers, but you want to always be on the side of being productive. You'll see what I'm talking about when, we, when you have one of these exercises, when you're faced with this situation. But communication is incredibly important there. All right. All right, I love this slide because it makes people uncomfortable which is supposed to. Okay, so do you tell this person what's going on? Raise your hand if you would tell this person what's going on. What if he's like, why are you looking at my junk? <laughs> right, there's risk there, right? Because part of it is like, hey, you want to help the dude out, but if you help the guy out, you're kind of telling him you're looking at, yeah, it's uncomfortable, right? <laughs> this is just kind of highlighting the situation you'll have when you're dealing with issues like, ideas. You're collaborating with someone and they come up with the most horrible idea, right? Do you want to just tell them that it's horrible? Because you don't want to wreck their day. You have to find a way to communicate around that. But you're going to be faced with situations like this all the time, right? And you have to find a strategy on how to get around that. Your team also has to be creative in all parts of the business. 
not just be creative in its product, but you might have to be creative on its funding, on its go-to-market strategy, on how it's going to generate revenue, right? I recently saw a pitch for someone who had a B2B to B2C company, which sounds completely ridiculous, except for it was an awesome idea. So, you know, you got to be super creative across the whole business. We talked about this a lot, and later this afternoon, you're going to have an expert on failure. Doesn't sound right. Someone who's an expert on studying failure, who will be here <laughs> later today to talk to you about that. But you have to take these risks, but you also have to accept and learn from the possibility of failure. This super hurts. I'm not sure if you've ever done this. But you don't want to do that again, right? You, you definitely learned from that experience. Another thing great teams do is prioritize and rationalize good decisions, right? They have to make, you have to know which decisions you need to make and which ones are a waste of time. If you are not good at prioritizing, you need someone on your team who is awesome at this. Right? Have you ever been in a meeting and you just kept talking in a particular direction and kept talking? That's probably someone who doesn't prioritize very well. Right? You need someone who can cut people off and prioritize the time for the entire team. And there are some people who are awesome at that. Good execution is more important than strategy because you're going to constantly change strategy over time. Right? But if you can't execute, all you are is a consulting firm, okay? So you need to learn how to be able to execute the things that you have in your plan. So we talked about teams. Those are some of the elements of, of a really good team to have those things. I'm gonna talk even more detail about how to construct a team that has this balance. But notice how, I mean, they're about 50 stories above the air. Right? And they feel so comfortable sitting next to each other. One could just slip and fall, right? But as a group, they're so comfortable up there that they trust you know, without a safety net, right? That's kind of the metaphor that I would say for your team. You need to build one that you feel so comfortable you could be on a bar like that with them, right? All right, so how did you choose your team wisely? Well, first of all, your team has to, this is my Olympic slide here. A team has to do a lot of things we just talked about. Ideation, team management, you have to grow the team, project management, product design, development, engineering, marketing and positioning, customer qualification, lead generation, business and revenue modeling. By the way, most of this stuff, if you buy a book on entrepreneurship, you'll see this whole list, right? You cannot do this by yourself, and you probably can't do this with even two or three people. So you're going to have to build a team that is incredibly diverse. You guys know rowing at all? How rowing works? It's a bunch of tall people, freakishly tall people, actually, being yelled at by a freakishly small person. Right? That is, that is diversity at its core. Right? Is you need that in order to win. And so we look at diversity in three different ways. One is business function, second is by roles, and the third is by dynamic. Let me first go into business function. On your team, and you guys have stickers on your, on your name tags, you see they're different colors, kind of aligned a little bit with this. Each team needs to have five different skills on there, different functions. One is someone who's very good at planning, we would call that a strategist. Someone who's great at design, and this is not just product design, but it could also be service design, program design. Then you need an engineer. You need someone who's going to actually build what you've designed. And then you need someone who can sell it. And then someone who's going to babysit the entire team. I don't understand why people want to be leaders. To be honest with you, on some level, having had to be the CEO of a company, I drew the short end of the stick. Actually, my first company, I was not the CEO. The CEO burned out and handed the keys to me and said, have at it, right? The project manager, it's a tough job. It's really tough to keep everybody focused on what they need to do. And by the way, if you start a, a company with two other friends, you know, you know, three founders, you can equally own the same amount of shares. Just because someone is the CEO 
doesn't make them any more valuable in terms of, of stock than anyone else. So remember that when you're building a team, just because you're not the CEO doesn't mean you're not important. Right? So f remember that that's, those are separate and distinct. There's another way to look at teams. I found this slide I thought was awesome. It's, I'm not sure if you guys are old enough to know this reference. Uh, but everyone plays a different role in a company. There's the idea guy. Not sure how many of you guys are the idea guy, the person who always comes up with all these awesome ideas. They're floating around in your head, probably right now, not paying attention to me, but you're coming up with the next big thing. Okay, so you guys look around. There's some people who are like that, right? How about the communicator? The person who's kind of the politician, the person who gets everyone to feel great about stuff, that we're going to all get this all done. You can be more than one, by the way. You can have more than one of these skills. All right, so some of you are politicians. Probably the best politicians didn't raise their hand because they didn't want others to know that they're really politicians. The peacemaker, right? The glues everything together. If something breaks or something falls apart or team members don't get along, you make sure that they, that they get back together. Okay, some of you, I'm seeing new people raise their hands. How about the problem finder, the detective? The person who like sees in the world like, why isn't there a food truck for like vegan Korean food on like, you know, Indian tapas, right? <laughs> Who's that person who finds the problem? Raise your hand if you're that person, right? Okay, there's some, some new people, right? How about the problem solver, the MacGyvers of the world? Raise your hand if you're a MacGyver, right? There's a lot of same. How about an executor? Raise your hand if you're a ninja, someone who like just gets stuff done. Raise your hand. Look at these people. These are people you want to hire. Like seriously, come see me afterwards because we need some ninjas. If anything, if you know, this is the person, if you've seen Pulp Fiction, it's also known as the wolf, the person who just fixes it, that's the, that's the ninja. How about the balloon popper? Raise your hand if you're the person who finds everything wrong with every product that they've ever seen in their entire lives. It's the wrong color, it doesn't feel right, it doesn't fit right, it makes you look fat. Raise your hand if you are this person who sees everything wrong with the world. Okay. All right, that, those, you want those people around because you want to point at, you want to introduce your product to them to see if they can see anything wrong with it. They're very valuable. Very difficult people to marry, unfortunately, but a very, very, very good skill set to have. All right, here's my favorite one. Who's the puppy shooter? Okay, so the puppy, sh so the puppy shooter, the puppy shooter is the person who sees the thing that everyone loves, the feature that is everybody is in love with, but it's taking months to finish. That's the person who says, we just need to shoot the puppy. It's not worth it. We need to just let it go. Who's the person who does that? Interesting. Some people raise their hand. How many of you guys are French? Interesting. Okay. Only, few, only one. I'm just curious because I, I, I tell this story. I did this whole presentation in Germany about the puppy shooter. And one guy in the front row raised his hand and goes, um, why shoots the puppy when you can just strangle it, right? Because they didn't get this was a metaphor. They were like, it's inefficient to shoot the puppy. You could just strangle it. Anyway, um, uh, just cultural interpretations are different. I know there's some Germans in the audience. Uh, but it's important to have all of these on your team. So this is what balance looks like. A diverse team has all of these in it, OK? There's another way to look at team Team uh, diversity. How many of you guys know how to dri drive a stick shift? So I have, okay, you, some of you guys will get this, right? Old days we used to have cars where we had to actually work to drive them. And you'd have a clutch, you'd have a brake, and you would have the accelerator. In each one of your teams, you need to have someone who is an accelerator, someone who is going to drive you fast and probably too fast, right? And push you quite far. But then you also need someone who's the break. He's like, wait, this is kind of insane. We got to slow this down, right? But then you also need someone who is the clutch, who has 
the foresight to know when to go faster and when to go slower. The clutch kind of you know, manages time and speed, right? So your team needs to have all three of these. I have seen teams that have been all accelerators. That was a disaster. That is a crazy disaster. Uh, I've seen teams that have been all breaks as well, and that is, that is also a disaster. The ones that are the most painful are when they're teams that are accelerators and breaks and there is no clutch. Someone's going to die. So there they can only be one when there's an accelerator and a break. So make sure your, your team has someone who plays that mediator role of being a clutch, okay? So when we talk about building teams, Building teams begins with you. And this whole process of beginning with you is a self-evaluation process where you have to look in the mirror. She's super cute. Um, she's looking in the mirror and seeing things that are the strong suits. What are your weaknesses? What are your key interests? Why do you even want to do a startup? Can you answer these questions, by the way? If you can't answer these questions, you are not ready to do a startup. I can tell you this right now. You have to, because you're going to be going into a, a, a job, startup, in which you're not going to sleep, when you're not going to see friends. You're going to be working so hard and with so much time. In fact, Jason, who's not here right now because I bet he's asleep, he was, he's part of CET last year and started his company a few months ago. He got here having not slept last night because he was working on his product, right? So if you're going to be spending your life doing those kinds of things, you better have had this self-assessment of why you're doing all this stuff. What are your personality quirks that might drive other people nuts? What is your risk profile? Are you, will, are you willing and ready to live on nothing, right? Especially in this Bay Area if you live in Berkeley, which is super expensive. So we are going to ask you guys to do this. Spend some time thinking through what your weaknesses are, what your strong suits are. Um, if your list of things that are strong suits are, is longer than your weaknesses list, you're not paying attention, okay? You wanna be honest with yourself. It doesn't mean that you're gonna forever suck at that. It just means you haven't put that much time or effort to being excellent at it, and that's okay, because there's plenty of people around you who have spent a lot of time becoming excellent excellent at things that you might not be good at. And it's more efficient for you to team up with those people than to become excellent at it, okay? Because you don't have that much time. Everyone will be competing against Google. Google has thousands, an army of thousands of engineers. If you wait to be awesome at everything, you will lose, okay? So you need to really understand these things. Also, my best favorite question is this one. What are your key interests? If you're doing a startup that has nowhere near anything that you're interested in, right? Let's say you love travel and it's an, you've built an app to help people buy paper, to toilet paper online. You are not going to be engaged in this thing because you're not gonna care about toilet paper only when you need it, right? So, cause that's when you actually do care, right? Um, so understand what you're interested in and focus on the things that will drive your passions, all right? So building this team that we just talked about, a balanced team has all three of these, these vectors of diversity. That's gonna be tough, right? How do you get a team that has all of these, you know, has brakes and accelerators, that has, you know, project manager and an engineer? How do you get all that balance? It's gonna be tough. It's not, we didn't say it's gonna be easy. And sometimes it breaks. But here's some pointers that I can give you as you build your team. Don't choose members because they are agreeable. You don't want yes men, right? Why are we paying both of you guys to have the same opinion? Right? Find smart people you can disagree with but can come to an agreement eventually, right? I talked about how conflict is important. We actually, and I'm gonna go into a little bit of an academic thing, we only know that things exist because there is conflict. Why do you think your eyes see something? Because some light 
photons are hitting some part of your, of your body, right, your eyes, and something is coming out of it, right? Everything that we know about science is because we've sent light at it, sound at it, something at it, and something has hit and responded back. You need conflict to know things. And if you don't conflict with the people on your team, how do you know you all know the same things and agree on the same decisions? So conflict is absolutely key to managing a good team. But you have to manage that conflict well or it gets out of control. So make sure everyone has the same rules about how you're going to, to argue ideas. You know that puppy shooter or the, uh, the balloon popper we were talking about? We used to have balloon shooting parties at my last company where we would take the latest idea up on the board and say, everyone throw as many darts at this as possible. And the person who had the, had the dart, essentially, that killed the idea would get a prize. So the person who was able to kill the idea won. And the reason we did that was because it's more expensive for us to pretend that there are no things wrong with it and discover later that our customers hate it than for us to figure it out now. So we reward the person who helps us avoid as many mistakes as possible. So disagreement is good. So make sure everyone on your team knows what your strengths and weaknesses are. Right? It sucks for them to hit the pothole later because you didn't tell them that it exists. Make sure you have that discussion so you know that you complement each other. Find those who fill your weaknesses and the people out there that you fill their weaknesses. Those are your best teammates. Set these ground rules on how you're going to communicate, how you're going to have conflict in, in controlled environments. Set clear, delineated roles and functions, what everyone's going to do on the team. And to set clear, achievable goals so that everyone can succeed. And make sure that you check up on each other regularly to make sure that the culture is strong. The reason why these two teams broke up over the summer is because they stopped communicating. And that is the worst thing for your team is if you stop talking to each other. You guys have any questions? Yes. Sure. So the question was, what's the best team that I was on? I would say the CET team that I'm currently on is awesome. Uh, but the best team that I have ever been on uh, was my last company. I think the first three years were amazing. Uh, we had times when people just voluntar voluntarily didn't get paid. They just offered to hold off getting paid so that the company could have some, some um, cash flow. Uh, we, had, we had people just working 24-7, loving it. And it's funny because when you go from everyone working their ass off and not getting paid enough to getting VC funding and now you can pay everybody and people can take vacation, that changes everything. We went from being a team that everyone, everyone wanted to be a part of to one that people were clocking in in the morning and clocking out at night. So something changes when you throw the money in there. So I would say the first three years of my last company was great. Yeah. Uh, what do you do if you, you bring somebody on board that has some good qualities and they start working with you and then you find somebody that has those same qualities, like similar personality, but it's like amazing. And are we talking about startups or are we talking about yeah. dating? No, no, no. Because <laughs> that sounds like startups. a that sounds like a startups. Because like if you have like two people kind of doing the same thing, it's kind of like a waste of money. But like you have I don't know. I feel like it's kind of hard to not value that first person all that time and commitment they've put into it so far. But then you know, what would you do? Yeah, that that's a good question. So there, there's the question was I, I think if I reduce it down to is what happens when you outgrow somebody because that's ultimately what happens is that you outgrow the company outgrows a particular person because maybe they don't need the skill set anymore i sometimes companies move from one revenue model to a different one from consumer to b2b and suddenly all the people who are doing work for you can't even code on this new platform right so at, po at certain points companies outgrow people and sometimes they'll outgrow you and that's what i would say with if you ever get a job at a big company and you get laid off, right? The company probably just outgrew the need for you, right? It doesn't mean that you're a bad person. It just means it's changing direction, right? 
And that's all that is, is that the, your company probably outgrew grew this person. That happens to everyone, including the CEO. So my last company outgrew me. So the last year, uh, we raised two rounds of funding, and I agreed to bring in a new CEO to take over the company into its growth stage. And I moved into strategy, which is code for pasture, right? With no power, just you know, a nice desk in the corner. But the company will outgrow everyone. That's if you're lucky, right? That's the whole point: is to grow a company that outlasts you, right? And some people, it just companies outgrow faster than others. But it's also incumbent on you to stay relevant, right? To increase your skill set, to become smarter in some other area, to stay relevant to your business. And, and frankly, if it, the company outgrows you, then it's better for both the company and you to find a place that you're better suited and that you're, you can contribute because clearly you know, you're no longer contributing to that company, right? So it's the way that you look at it, but ultimately you do, uh, you will all be outgrown by your company if you're lucky, right? How did you realize, okay. How did you realize the point when you uh, decided to bring the next CEO? I mean, what was the feeling when you said, okay, the company already outgrew me? What was the situation uh, at that point? It was a little, so it's a little more complicated. Um, I got a, I, at the time, I found several companies to buy us. It was a hot time, and there was a great exit for us, you know, to sell the company. The VC firm disagreed on the strategy, didn't want to sell because they thought it was going to be a billion dollar exit, and I didn't see that. And so we got to a point where we agreed that I would, I would step aside if I could help bring on the new CEO, help identify this person, as well as uh, raise the next round. So I brought in the next round and, and brought this person in. And you know, at the time, it, it, was, it seemed to be a wise decision, right? Because I, I wanted the company to find the right path for it. So that, that's kind of how it all went down. Who is it? Yes. <coughs> Maybe it's uh, like this, this is, it's, should be different, different cultures. I don't know, sometimes like clear dead, uh, delineated roles and functions. Sometimes in other cultures are not so clear enough and, and it, it works because they, they, because in a startup you do, you do everything. So. That's, tr that's true, and actually let me clarify what this means. I don't mean that you are just the marketing person and no one else can do marketing. It's that if there's a project that comes along that says, hey, we need to market in this area, someone has to say, I will lead that, and then other people will join that group to do that. But someone has to raise their hand and say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna run with that, right? It could be the project manager over here, or it could be the marketing person or someone, but Someone has to say, I have got that covered, rather than just people assuming the person with the marketing title always gets it. So you have to be, what I mean is be explicit that this person is responsible, right? And yeah. wouldn't you also say that? Oh. Yeah, um, just correct me if I'm, I'm wrong. I just want to point out something. Um, um, building a company, a startup, doesn't mean you have to stay on that startup forever. Um, there, there's a profile of uh, entrepreneurs. There are starters. They are there to for the first two to three years, and then they're gone, and they're up to build uh, something else. So, um, don't think that if you're gonna gonna start a company, you're gonna be there forever. Maybe you, you don't have that profile, and the. Other thing is, uh, you were saying before um, about um, projection and, and building the companies, and if you're not happy with, with what you're doing or you're happy with what you're doing, um, there's a s simple exercise that everyone can do. If you're, if, if you're whining because it's Monday, and if you're celebrating because it's Friday, then you have, you're probably dead, alive. You, you, you probably have a serious problem because when you're pursuing your dreams and building your company and, and, and seeking to achieve your biggest dreams, you don't have a problem with Mondays or, or, or you don't have a problem with uh, Fridays. Every day is a great day. I agree. I would agree with that. And what I also wanted to add to the list is that it's important that all the people have the same mindset. So that if you have a, a certain goal, the goals of the company should be before of the be, uh, in front of the personal goals. 
Because if you have people that are trying to pursue personal goals instead of the company's goals, you would have like a, a different uh, culture in the company and you don't want to, to have it like that. that. So that that's a great point. If you have the luxury of choosing that, that's great. I think some, some of you guys live in countries where um, the entrepreneurial mindset is rare, right? We're trying to change that here with this program so that you guys get some more of this and then bring it back home and hopefully it's infectious and everyone uh, becomes more entrepreneurial. But the fact remains, most countries, they're, they're more closed mindset, right? That they're more about nine to five. And in France, it's actually 35 hours a week, right? Which is different. Um, it's just a different culture. So if you can build a team where everyone has that same mentality, that's great. But you're gonna have to find a way to cultivate that in people and get people to become that because you might not have enough people who already have that. Those people in some countries may all be entrepreneurs already. So, you know, it's going to be hard to find them. But you're right. Having shared mind mindset is great. The other part, one of the, um, one of the job questions that I ask whenever I hire someone is, what, tell me about the biggest hardship you've ever had in your life. It's really important to hear that. Some people, like, wow, I've had it easy my entire life. At, at my co-founder of my first company, and this is, I mean, he was my best friend at the time, and I ended up having to fire him, which is horrible. If you ever have to do that, I just count that as a, as a hardship in it of itself. But his biggest failure, his biggest hardship he's ever had was that he was waitlisted at Harvard. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just, like, totally ridiculous that you would even count that, right? But that's his number one thing. Uh, I count, you know, if you have a learning disability, if you're, um, I think if you're left-handed in a country where you're not allowed to be left-handed, I think that's, that's an interesting thing. I think if you have been ostracized in some way in, in your society, that is the basis of success. And there's plenty of research to back it up. I was actually talking to Dave Law today about Malcolm Gladwell's new book about David and Goliath. There is something to be said about those who have had some kind of hardship. So if, if you've had that, I encourage, you know, have teammates that also have that because they know what it means to have it tough and what drives them is to never have it tough like that again, right? One more question, yep. Yeah, um, it's a very basic, basic question. I wanted to know if um, for startups, sometimes if, if you're serving as a team, for example, like you and your best friend, how do you divide your, like how do you set the job descriptions? And if you're, for example, in the beginning, everybody will be doing everything, I guess. And then how does it change and how you set the job description of the CEO, for example, and who does what? And um, also if there is, uh, like, uh, if it's your idea with your best friend, for example, and then how do you choose the boss, maybe, or choose the CEO, or how does it come that who, who makes the final decision? Okay. Yeah. Um, how many of you guys come from countries where you would say it's a hierarchical system? There's, a, there's definitely a boss, and then there's definitely people who work for them, right? How many of you guys come from countries where it can be distributed management? They call like group management or cultural race. What country is that? The US is very much like that, yeah. So the US has a different model where you can collaborate. No one really needs to be the boss. People tend, what they say is someone is in charge of this particular element, right? And then it just kind of self-organizes. Notice in your exercise where you guys figured out each other's names. How did you guys organize? We saw some of you guys, there's someone who kind of stepped up to be the leader. And in other cases, you guys kind of self, kind of all kind of agreed on how you're going to do this. That's culture. So if you decide in your team, in your co company, to organize that it's gonna be more of a group decision, then that's how it's gonna be and that's how it should be. In other cases, it may be very clear that everyone needs very clear direction from one person. And that person tends to kind of show themselves as being the person who makes the most wise decision, isn't a tyrant, and also shares in the success and and um, the information that they have, right? It's, there's someone who's open, they're open communicator. That kind of, over time, reveals itself. You might work with your co-founder and realize that the, the guy's a complete jerk, right? 
And at that point, you have to make a decision about how you're going to set up the company. But I wouldn't make any job descriptions or titles or even declare someone as the boss until you guys have worked together to figure out how it all kind of works out. And what you'll find is that people show themselves as being great at something. Then they just keep getting more of that work, right? And people tend to move to the directions that they're good at. And let that all reveal itself. Don't, don't force a, a definition on people until they've shown that they're great at it. Yeah. Steven, you want to add something? What do you mean? Uh, discuss the how to set up a role and what mm -hmm. the company needs to have done, and then people right. fill the roles, and eventually, you know yeah. who's doing the most work. And exactly. So this what I was describing earlier is that you just let it kind of happen, where people are like, let's say, hey, we need we need to build a prototype, right, as a team, and then someone's like, well, someone's got to design it, right? And someone's like, well, I could do some design work because I that's kind of what I do. Then we need to kind of build a mini prototype. Someone else says, hey, I, I'm really good at building. If you don't have people stepping up to these roles, then you're missing people on your team, right? You need those people. But it should be based on need. Our company needs the nec this next thing. And then as a team, you problem solve to figure out how you're going to solve that next thing and who steps up into a leadership role to accomplish that, right? That's all, that's all it needs to be. And over time, you start getting evidence. Wow, this person's really good at organizing everyone together. Maybe this person should be the operations person because it, and project manager because they're constantly able to get everyone together. It, but it just happens. And you should earn it. This is meritocracy. Let people earn the roles that they should do. Doesn't mean they're any more important than someone else. It just means they're really good at this particular skill. Yes. Yeah, I think we're done, right? Because I'm running, yeah, I'm like, that's a great idea. Yeah. It's hot up here. I don't know if you guys know how hot the lights are. And I'm not used to wearing a shirt like this because I, you know, wear t-shirts and stuff. But I'm an entrepreneur, what, I, what do you want, right? Um, what's the next? I think we've got, is it, Ant, you next? <laughs>